Sorry, I got an attitude today. <laughs> so this is Palm Sunday, and on Palm Sunday, it's my tradition to read to you the passage of uh, the scripture that this is based on. Just decided to go wild there. So in uh, Matthew 21, uh, beginning in verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and they brought the colt and they placed their cloaks on them and Jesus sat on them. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowd that went ahead of them and those that followed, they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who's this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables, the money changers, and the benches of those selling doves. So, Lord, teach us from this your word, this triumphant entry, this celebration that we already know turns sour so soon and help us to uh, to see you in new eyes just as you look into our lives that's our prayer in jesus name amen so um palm sunday i just want you to know almost every palm sunday of my life when i'm preaching i always talk about you know the big celebration and how everybody's really excited about jesus and they're celebrating and then it kind of turns you know and we get the dark side later on in the week and how fickle the crowd i have done that sermon so many times you probably are tired of it and uh, yet that often is the message of this but what i want to do today is look at this a little bit different Because when I read the passage this week, preparing for today, I saw something in it that I'd never seen before, ever. And all the, I don't know, 35 times I've preached on, uh, I've never seen this before. And that is that when they go into the city and the people of the city are wondering, what's going on? Who is this? What's happening here? It's not the disciples who answer them. It's not Jesus' closest followers who say, well, let me tell you, let me share my faith, let me talk to you about it. I never saw that before. Who tells them? The crowds, the least likely, the least qualified, are the ones who are giving the witness when they come into the city. And so it got me thinking about the power of being in a crowd, but also what does God want to have happen to us and through us uh, as we're part of a crowd. Um, have any of you ever been in a crowd? Ever? <laughs> I, I grew up in Southern California, so we always did the Rose Parade. I don't know if that counts or not, but it's kind of like, usually I was asleep by the time the USC band came by, you know, but, um, but that was kind of a crowd. One of the fun crowds that I was in was uh, uh, several years ago, um, I heard the Rolling Stones were coming to Los Angeles and that they were going to play the Rose Bowl. So I pulled strings and rented the owner's box at the Rose Bowl for their opening night concert. The box up above. Cool. And uh, I, I flew down my small group from Walnut Creek, uh, and uh, Damien came, and, and I asked the president of Fuller Seminary to join us. <laughs> and his vice president said, don't even ask, that's rude. <laughs> of course, he's not interested in that, but he came. <laughs> Who's going to miss this? So anyway, so we're sitting up there, and, and one little thing, a side thing, you know, at the one of the intermissions, David and I go out to the t-shirt stand, and and, uh, and he goes, uh, "Hey, there's Rod Stewart." And I went, "Everybody looks like Rod Stewart at a Rolling Stones concert." <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> he was in the room next to us, but um, so the thing was. Um, we were there and looking out, and we started to have a theological discussion during the concert. Well, the first thing was, I asked the president of the seminary what he thought of this. And his answer was, it sounds like one long song. <laughs> it's all the same. <laughs> he didn't get it. But, um, <laughs> but we started talking, and we said, wait a minute. What does this gathering have here? Thousands of people, 
throngs. And there was um, remembrance, people remembering from their youth or different experiences, music, things like that. It was a celebration. Uh, for some people, it was a pagan worship service. Right. Mm -hmm. um, people had given a huge offering to come in. <laughs> Uh, not counting what I had to give to get the owner's box, but it was an offering. And, uh, and we talked about it, and then we said, said, guess what? In these three nights that this is going to go on here in Pasadena, there'll be more people at these, at these three pagan celebrations than in every church and synagogue in the Los Angeles basin this weekend. Mm -hmm. Wow. We were part of the crowd. Now, Damien had a, a real interesting take on it because he had prepared by listening and listening and listening to some of the music, which may have created problems later in life. But, um, <laughs> but he felt like the songs were personal when he listened to them and that they were speaking to him. And when we were there at the stadium, he went into kind of a depression. I said, what's wrong? And he went, I just realized it's not personal. It has nothing to do with me. They don't know me. I don't know them. I'm just here. And it forever changed the way he listened to music. And so I started thinking about that. That was my experience in a crowd. And, and what is it about a crowd is that you feel like you're part of something, but you're not really. Isn't that weird? You're there. It's all happening around you, but you're not really involved in it. I mean, I felt pretty close to Nick and the boys, you know, because I, I was above the crowd. I got to look out over them. But it still wasn't personal. I was an observer. I was an observer. Okay, I was there. But I wasn't part of it. So, we come to this triumphal entry in Matthew. And we see the power of the crowds. They're all there. And they're celebrating, and they're observing, and they're watching. And it made me think, uh, you know, you have the video program starting up, right, that you're going to start. And, and I started thinking about the way they do things in videos. And uh, this may sound a little obtuse, but I've been watching reruns of Sherlock on the British Broadcasting <laughs> and with Benedict Cumberbatch. That name, he'll never have a career. But um, but um, I'm watching it, and they have an interesting way to do the, the cinematography because he's there, and he's observing things, and he's analyzing, and then suddenly you begin to see on the screen what's going on in his head. It's the weirdest thing to watch. And, and all, what he's thinking and what it reminds him of, and that's going on in the background while he's having his little conversation. And so I thought, I wonder what would happen if we were filming this triumphant entry. And, and we're focusing on Jesus uh, coming in on the donkey, right? And the crowd's all around. What would be going on in the visuals around him? You know what it would be? I bet as he's going down the road and all these people are there, he's looking into the crowd and he's remembering people that he's already seen, that he's already met, that had followed him before, that had been part of crowds in other situations. And conversations that they had and healings that took place and, and miracles that happened and teaching and instruction and questioning and all of those things that, that go into those relationships, those people are the ones longing uh, all around on the street celebrating. And so he's not looking at a crowd anymore. He's now looking at you, at me, at the lives, at history, and it's all happening right there. So I went back earlier in Matthew, to um, Matthew 9, maybe? Listen to this. Jesus went through all the towns, all the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. In verse 36. When he saw the crowds, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them 
He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That's Jesus' response to the crowds. He looked out at the crowds. He's among them. He's healing. He's teaching. He's proclaiming. He's all of these things going on. And as he looks at them, his response is uh, compassion. Compassion because they were harassed and helpless. Like a sheep without a shepherd. And then I thought, isn't that what he would see if he looked at us today? Isn't that what he'd see? But, uh, I looked up some definitions of harassed, and one of them is that they're mangled. Mangled. And, and, and Jesus... Uh, Compassion goes out to them because of this, this suffering that's going on. And, and uh, compassion is uh, suffering with compassion. It's suffering alongside. It's coming alongside them and suffering with them to, to share in that suffering. So Jesus wasn't aloof from the crowd. He wasn't critical of them. He wasn't... Uh, distant from them. He wasn't saying, line up over here and take a number and I'll, I'll treat you one by one. He just looks out and he sees them and he sees that they are mangled and helpless. Now, that word compassion is so interesting, uh, maybe because I lack it so much in my own life probably, but um, you know, some of you are, are heroic in this. I mean, uh, I remember when our when our dear friend Charlotte uh, was coming up on the days before her death, and Susie, I know you and some of uh, her other really good friends made a, a covenant to stay with her twenty four seven and care for her and take care and love her through it. And I would guess that that was not an easy thing. I would guess that that may have been one of the most difficult things that any of you have ever done. And um, and yet that was compassion. That was we're going to suffer with you through this. We're going to go through this with you. Um, that's a huge, huge statement. And that's what Jesus does, does for us. So you live, you live that out too. Now, suffering and pain are not exactly the same. Everybody's got pain, right? Everybody hurts from time to time. Things happen. Uh, emotional pain, physical pain, relational pain, all these things go on and, and we, we feel broken. The suffering is a little bit different than that because the suffering involves uh, what goes on beyond that initial pain, right? So we have a, an incident of brokenness, but then what, what happens as a result of that down the road? And there's all kinds of implications for it. When we're emotionally mangled, right? That suffering can go on even when the pain stops. But we go on suffering. And, and, um, and Jesus sees that. And he says, let me come and, and be with you in that. In the time where it's the effects of your brokenness. And he said the people, we saw him, he said they, they were like, a, like sheep without a shepherd. I think he saw what they needed. What they need. What do the people in the crowds need? A shepherd, right? Someone to care for them in their mangledness, someone to lead them out of the destructive stuff, someone to bring them back together and get them back on track, someone to give them a, a, a life and a future. They needed Jesus, like we do. Sometimes we forget that, you know, because... Uh, uh, we're, you know, hip people here in Seattle, and, and we we find people who are mangled and lost and suffering, and we go, you know, what they really need is a good meal. 
which could be something they need, but, but, or they need counseling, or they need uh, something. What they need might be Jesus, just like those early crowds. They need a shepherd. And I got to tell you, I know most of you, you're not the shepherd. Okay, just saying. And neither am I. I'm definitely not the good shepherd, that's for sure. You all know that. But uh, that's what Jesus is. And so we don't go in and say, okay, I'm going to come alongside people and shepherd them. I'm going to come alongside people and fix their pain and their situation. And I'm going to correct all these things. No, 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 no. It's like the Bible says, don't do that. That's the shepherd's job. Just introduce them to the shepherd. You don't have to fix everything. But you can introduce them to the one who will. That's what we can do. Uh, the Dalai Lama, I, say, I, I, don't, I usually don't quote the Dalai Lama, but why not? You know, uh, he has this great insight. That I, I saw this week. He said, if you really want to help somebody, show compassion. And then, he said, if you really want to help yourself, show compassion. In other words, it works both ways, right? Show compassion to others, and it'll change their life. Show compassion to yourself, and it'll change your life. I'm thinking about that. Why is it that we say things to ourselves that we would never say to our friends? Why is it that when, when, when we get down on ourselves and we're talking, we would never say that to people that we work with, but we're saying it to ourselves. We could be very kind to people out there, but to ourselves, we're not showing compassion. Maybe it's time that we start doing that. We should treat ourselves the way Jesus treats us. I, I was struck with this because about a few weeks ago, I got a call from a, a publisher who wanted me to write a kind of a blurb. You know how they do on the covers, a little blurb, another author thing, you know, uh, recommending this book. And, and the book was called Give Yourself a Break, written by a, a counselor on the East Coast named um, Kim Fredrickson. The book's not out yet. And it may or may not have my review on it. <laughs> but um, she, she basically was going through this as a psychologist and saying, whatever happened to showing compassion to ourselves? Why are we so hard on ourselves? Why are we harder on ourselves than God is? Why are we harder on ourselves than Jesus would ever be? And why do we think, sure, Jesus is caring and compassionate to them, but not to me. So we hold on to our suffering long after it's useful. I think it's time to be compassionate for ourselves too. Because if you want to help somebody else, show compassion. If you, if you want to help yourself, show compassion to you. Right? That makes a huge difference. How do we change? How can we change? This is Palm Sunday. This is Jesus coming into the city. This is the crowds at their best getting it right before they got it wrong. How do we bring about change? And how do we, how do we help change others? Um, Frederick Buechner, a novelist from uh, Vermont, said this, um, the power of God stands in violent contrast with the power of people. It's not external like people's power. It's internal. By applying external pressure, I can make a person do what I want them to do. That's people power. As for making them do what I want them to see, that's answer. As for making them be what I want them to be without at the same time destroying their freedom, only love can make that happen. How do we help you be what you've been made to be? 
Love makes it happen, not coercively, but by creating a situation in which of our own free will, we want to be what love wants us to be. I think that's what Jesus wants to do in the crowd. I think that's what he wants to do in us, in our crowdedness. I think he wants to look at us with, through the eyes of compassion and love us to the point where we could start to be what he always intended us to be from the very beginning. And at the same time, he does it in a way that we choose it. We want that too. I don't know about you, but I'm really tired of being stuck in my old ways. Am I alone in that? You're tired of me being stuck in my old ways too. I know. I know. I get what you're thinking. I, I'm right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but isn't it amazing how we put so many years into becoming the way we are that we're not going to change without a fight? We got this way. So, so what? I say, I got this way. Nobody's going to make me change. And that is true. Nobody can make me change. But Jesus, looking at the crowd and seeing me, can love me to the point where I go, you know, I want to be the person that he sees me as. When Jesus looks in your eyes, who does he see? He probably doesn't see the person you see when you're scolding yourself in front of the mirror. Or I usually do my scolding when I'm driving because that gets me a little more aggressive. You know, but um, he doesn't do He looks at his love. And so when we begin to see ourselves through the eyes of love and through the eyes of compassion and we begin to see compassion for ourselves, all of a sudden, we want to be what God made us to be. Right? And that's how the change happens. That's exactly how the change happens. This Easter, it's not the time for you to make a list of all the things you want to change and then start trying to do it. Please. There were years I might have said that to you, but not, not now. I think this is the year that we say, Lord, help me to see my life through the eyes of love. The way you see me when you see me in the crowd. Let me be that person. In a way, you might say that's hard, but in a way, that's really easy because you don't have to try anymore. I'm so tired of trying. What? Instead, it's more of a releasing. And saying, wait a minute. Jesus paid the price for my wackiness and my stupidity and my willfulness and my sin. That was all on the cross. That's Good Friday. We'll, we'll get to that. And he rose from the dead. That's, that's next Sunday. We'll get to that. And, and is alive. And so we can live in this resurrection power. But in the meantime, right? In the meantime, I want to see me the way Jesus sees me when he spots me in the crowd. I want you to see you the way Jesus sees you when he spots you in the crowd. And then we can commit to becoming that. Because we want to. Because we're free to. And we're loved into it. Okay. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we've been in the crowd a long time. We've been present, but watching. We've been seeing, but observing. We've been hearing, but not really listening. And, and Lord, we've been not compassionate to ourselves or anybody else. But Lord, we pray that, that your compassion will seep out and transform us from within. That's our greatest need today, in Jesus' name.